Good afternoon and welcome to the Scapins International Society Symposium of SOE 2017. I'm Jerry Sabag and I want to thank the organizing committee for inviting us to present this symposium. I have to apologize on behalf of my co-moderator, Professor Suzanne Binder, who will not be able to attend today. Our first speaker is Professor Einar Stefansson, who will present the effects of vitreous and vitrectomy on ocular physiology and cataract formation. Einar. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Thank you for coming. Now, I will speak about the physics and physiology of the vitreous humor in, in, in the uh, context of vitreous surgery and the changes that take place in the vitreous uh, uh, through our lifetime and what the clinical consequences are of this. Now, uh, uh, having worked in ophthalmology for more than three decades now, the one tends to have a uh, historical uh, perspective. And uh, it's just amazing how much our, uh, uh, our uh, thoughts of the vitreous uh, humor, the vitreous gel, have changed uh, even uh, in my lifetime or in, 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 my, in the time of my career. Uh, I remember int, uh, intracapsular uh, cataract surgery. And at that time, the vitreous was uh, untouchable. If you touch the vitreous, if something happened to the vitreous, the eye would basically die. We all knew this. Now then came, came vitrectomy, and now we could remove the vitreous and throw it away, and we really thought that that would have no consequence, that we could just take the, the, the vitreous away, re, uh, replace it with water, and th there would be no consequence to other tissues of the, of, of the eye. At, at that time, the vitreous was also pretty much invisible. Yes, we had the slit lamp, we had some uh, 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 ultrasound, but really no good ways of examining, uh, especially the posterior, posterior parts of the vitreous, PVDs and things like that. Now, all of this has changed, and now we know the vitreous is none of these things, uh, and is very much at the center, not only of the eye, but the center of ophthalmic uh, physiology. Now, what we found out uh, early on uh, uh, in the context of vitrectomy was that there were clinical and physiological consequences of, let's say, removing the vitreous. One of the early uh, uh, observations was that if you removed the vitreous in a diabetic eye, you did not have retinal neovascularization come back. So vitrectomy pretty much stopped the process of retinal neovascularization. But at the same time, these eyes would be, would be at, at increased risk for iris uh, neovascularization in the front of the eye. So it was a great, quest, great uh, uh, speculation at the time, why uh, 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 does this change uh, so much? Same thing with diabetic macular edema. In the early 90s, uh, 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 we found that uh, uh, vitrectomy improves diabetic macular edema. It's uh, uh, the it, reduces the um, thickness of the retina and in some cases uh, 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 improves the vision. And then a negative aspect is that following uh, vitrectomy, you indeed get uh, cataracts, you get nuclear sclerosis cataract. So all of these are, are clinical uh, consequences of uh, 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 removing the vitreous and replacing it uh, 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 with water. And I will discuss uh, some of the mechanisms. Why is this happening? And then we will also um, look at how does this extend not only to, vit to vitrectomy, but also to the natural changes that happen in the uh, uh, vitreous cavity. Now, w one of the characteristics of the vitreous humor is that it is a viscous gel. You, you all know it's 99% water, so uh, chemically speaking, it's very close to being water, but it's highly viscous. And what difference does the uh, viscosity make? Well, the uh, viscosity affects the transport of molecules across the vitreous cavity. So whether that uh, transport is by diffusion or by diffusion or by, or by uh, uh, convection currents, the transport is reduced 
linearly with the increased viscosity. So if the uh, viscosity of, of the uh, 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 vitreous gel is, let's say, five times that of water, it slows down the uh, uh, transport of glucose or oxygen or VEGF five times. So you can say that the role of the vitreous gel is to modulate, is to slow down the transport of molecules, and this is all molecules, across the uh, 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 vitreous cavity from the retina to the lens or from a one area of the retina to another. This is something that uh, uh, is known from classical physics, and uh, I'll give you, I'll scare you with a few formulas. I'm, I'm not going to dwell uh, uh, on them, but if we, if we look at Fick's law of diffusion, you can see the diffusion uh, coefficient, which is a capital D, and Stokes and Einstein worked out a formula for the, for the uh, 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 for the uh, diffusion uh, uh, coefficient, you see a uh, uh, capital D there. And the important part is that uh, 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 it is inversely related to the uh, viscosity of the medium. And the same is true for the um, formula for fluid flow, which uh, I'm, I am sure you know well, the Hagen uh, Pozzuoli law. Also, their viscosity is, is inversely related to uh, flow. And of course, this makes intuitive sense that indeed the more viscous the, the, the medium, the slower the fluid flow and the slower the uh, diffusion. Uh, uh, so, this is common sense, but it's also classical physics, and it's something that we have confirmed with direct experiments. You see the reference below. Now, Back in the 1980s, uh, uh, we worked on this in, in animal models. And uh, one quite important uh, uh, experiment, which was done at that time, is shown here to show how vitrectomy influences hypoxia in the retina. So what we did was to create uh, hypoxia by uh, inducing a branch retinal vein occlusion in cat eyes and then uh, I, I had previously done vitrectomy in, in one eye and not in the other eye of each cat, and then measuring the oxygen tension uh, uh, over the retina or in the vitreous uh, 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 simultaneously in both eyes in a number of cats. And you can see the, 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 uh, uh, the uh, histogram below. It shows you that uh, before the branch vein occlusion, you have a normal and similar uh, PO2 level of about 20 millimeters of mercury, both in the a uh, uh, normal eye and the vitrectomized eye. But then when the branch vein occlusion is introduced, you can see that the normal eye, that is the non-vitrectomized eye, shows quite dramatic hypoxia, which is what you expect when you occlude uh, the blood vessels. But that's not the case in the vitrectomized eye. So the vitrectomy somehow protected the retina from becoming hypoxic when ischemia was introduced. And here's an, an explanation for what happens in, in a schematic. So on the uh, uh, left-hand side, you see what is uh, supposed to be the normal eye with the vitreous gel intact. And, and the fluxes of any molecule, oxygen, VEGF, drug molecules, glucose, I mean, this is true for any molecule, are quite slow through the viscous gel of the vitreous. On the right-hand side, you see a vitrectomized eye. So now the vitreous uh, gel is gone. There's just uh, fluid there, just water. And now the, the fluxes of, let's say, oxygen and VEGF and everything else are increased. And since the uh, 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 difference in, in uh, uh, viscosity between water and vitreous gel is at least five times, we're talking about the fluxes being increased by at least five-fold. So we have a much more effective transport of these molecules uh, across the vitreous cavity. And this has positive consequences, and it has negative consequences. Nancy Holocamp and David Beebe uh, in the United States uh, uh, looked at this in the human uh, 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 about uh, 10 years ago and, and, and uh, ongoing research. And they indeed confirmed that in, in the vitrectomized eye, the PO2 in the vitreous is, is higher 
than in a non-vitrectomized eye, exactly because the oxygen fluxes from the retina into the vitreous are faster. And they pointed out that this is damaging to the lens because the lens in the normal eye is basically hypoxic. I will, I'll, I'll go back to show you that. So if you look at, at this the, in the normal eye, the uh, oxygen flux from the retina to the back of the lens is very slow in the normal eye and the PO2 at the back of the lens is very low in the range of seven to 10 millimeters of mercury. Whereas in the vitrectomized eye, where the flux is much faster, now the back of the eye, back of the, of the, back of the lens has PO2 of maybe 15 to 20. And as a consequence the, of the increased oxygen, the lens uh, develops a cataract. So this is a negative consequence of the increased uh, 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 oxygenation of, of, uh, of the lens. And this was indeed pointed out by Holikamp and Beebe. Here we see another uh, uh, slide from them showing again on top the normal eye with the very little oxygen flux from the, from the retina into the vitreous gel. And then below the, uh, the, the vitrectomized eye, more oxygen flowing from the retina to the lens and then uh, 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 the increased uh, oxygen results in the uh, uh, nuclear sclerosis cataract formation. Now what uh, BP and Holocamp have also uh, pointed out is that there is an antioxidant in the vitreous gel. This is uh, a vitamin C, this is uh, uh, ascorbate. And uh, as oxygen diffuses into the, the uh, uh, vitreous gel at higher rates, the, it, it, uh, uh, it, it uh, 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 oxidizes the uh, ascorbate, and so the concentration of that is reduced. So the re re reduced uh, levels of uh, ascorbate in the vitrectomized eye is a consequence of the increased oxygen fluxes. So it's uh, another biochemical change that happens as a consequence of the change in, in viscosity. The fact that uh, vitrectomy leads to an increased oxygen tension in the uh, uh, vitreous cavity has been shown with a, a variety of techniques. I've shown you some of the invasive technologies, both in the animals and in the human. There is a recent uh, paper in IOVS where this was shown with uh, uh, MRI uh, imaging, indeed showing a higher oxygen tension in the uh, uh, eye after uh, 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 pars plana vitre uh, vitrectomy. And the same thing has been shown by Martin Sheen uh, in the Czech Republic using retinal oximetry, where uh, 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 the uh, imaging device is, is, uh, is used to measure the oxygen saturation of the retinal arterioles and venules. You can see on the image below uh, uh, the, the oximap uh, 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 image where the red color, you can see the scale on the, on, on the, on the uh, right hand side, the red color of the uh, Arterial shows that they are 95% saturated. The green color of the veins shows that they are 50 to 60% uh, saturation. And Martin Sheen used this technology to uh, demonstrate that following vitrectomy, indeed, the oxygen sa saturation of the retinal veins was significantly increased. So we have basically four different uh, technologies uh, that have demonstrated and validated that indeed there is this change, this increase in oxygen uh, uh, tension in the vitreous cavity following vitrectomy. Now this summarizes a, a little bit of the situation. So if we have in the, in the top uh, left corner, you have what is the normal eye. And so again, the vitreous gel is filling the, the uh, uh, cavity, the transport of, uh, let's say, VEGF or oxygen to take those examples is very, very, very little. This also means that if you have an ischemic area, a branch vein occlusion or an area of capillary non-perfusion in diabetes, uh, the, you have very little chance of oxygen coming from, let's say, a better perfused area to, to contribute to, to that zone. And also, the VEGF that may be produced in that ischemic area cannot diffuse away, cannot escape at any large or any, any speedy way. On the top 
right hand side, you see the vitrectomized eye. So here, these fluxes are much greater. They're five times greater or more. So now, if you now imagine an ischemic area, a branch vein occlusion, let's say, or, an, or a, a, a capillary non-profusion in diabetes, now you can have oxygen flowing from the other side of the eye, from a well-perfused part of the retina, to relieve the hypoxia, as we saw in the beginning in the cats. And also, the VEGF and other cytokines that may be formed in that ischemic area can now escape. They can be cleared into the uh, vitreous cavity and escape the, the, uh, uh, from that area of, of ischemia. Below, on the uh, right left side, you have the silicon oil field dye. Silicon oil is very viscous and sort of replaces the, the uh, uh, vitreous gel, the high viscosity again slows down the, the uh, transport. So the silicon oil field eye is physiologically somewhat like the, the normal eye with the vitreous in place in that sense. And then on the lower uh, right hand side, you see the one chamber eye where the lens is gone also and, and these currents are, are, are even greater. Now, when you know this about the physiology of the uh, uh, vitreous, you can put it into context with the, uh, 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 the pathophysiology of ischemic retinal disease and how we are treating it. So in the center here, you see a, a schematic, what's somewhat simplistic, uh, 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 flowchart of the, of, uh, uh, the patho pathophysiology, or let's say of diabetic retinopathy. We have ischemia and hypoxia at the top, which through the hypoxia-inducible factor uh, uh, leads to uh, the production of VEGF. VEGF then gives us neovascularization and edema. And if we think about how our treatment approaches influence this, vitrectomy reduces the retinal hypoxia, the local retinal hypoxia. We have just seen the data for that. Retinal photocoagulation coagulation also does that through a different mechanism. It destroys the, the uh, photoreceptors, reduces the oxygen consumption of the retina, thereby reduces hypoxia. So that's where those treatment options fit in. Then when we get down to, the, uh, to uh, VEGF, well, if we do a vitrectomy, and we have now have this low viscosity fluid in the vitreous cavity, VEGF and other cytokines can now escape from the retina. They can be cleared from the retina into the vitreous cavity. So their concentration in the area of ischemia, be that in a, uh, uh, an area of uh, uh, um, uh, diabetic macular edema or an area of uh, AMD, neovascular AMD, the VEGF can be cleared out. So the concentration is lowered. Of course, at the same time, we uh, uh, inject the anti-VHF drugs uh, 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 for, the, for the same purpose. And, and keep in mind there that the effect of vitrectomy is mirrored by the effect of a, of a vitreous detachment. So if we have a vitreous detachment, that has pretty much the same physiological or metabolic effect as does vitrectomy, meaning there is now low viscosity fluid in front of the retina as opposed to a high viscosity gel. And we are learning slowly, and there, are, there is an emerging clinical association between vitreoretinal adhesion and some of the uh, 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 macular, and, and well, well uh, diabetic uh, macular edema, and neovascularization in diabetes, same thing in, in, a, in A and D. Basically, if you have vitreoretinal adhesion, that eye is more likely to develop uh, macular edema. It is also more likely to develop a neovascularization. Now, the conventional ex explanation for these clinical uh, uh, observations have always been that, uh, uh, th that there must be traction ca causing the edema. Sometimes there is, but not in all cases. And that the neovascularization effect is because you need the vitreous scaffold to, for the vessels to grow on. Now, the vitreous scaffold idea is absolute nonsense because vessels can grow pretty much on any surface, including the retina itself. So they, they don't need a scaffold to grow on. The reason why 
uh, like in diabetic retinopathy, the vessels only grow into the vitreous and, and only grow where there is vitreous is because of the metabolic effect of the vitreous, not that it is needed as a scaffold to grow on. So the metabolic effect of the vitreous gel is quite an adequate, or at least a possible, explanation for these clinical phenomena. We mentioned, though, that, vitre, that vitreoretinal um, traction is real, and of course, in some cases, it is the reason for, ma for ma uh, macular edema. So, macular edema can be, can be stimulated, on one hand, by, simply by the vitreous adhesion, but also by the traction. But let me ask you, how does traction cause edema? What is the mechanism for edema causing, for attraction causing uh, uh, macular, macular edema. And this takes us even farther back in classical physics and physiology because this takes us back to Newton's third law. So as you see here, uh, uh, Newton's uh, third law is, is, is that for every action, he called force an action, so we would say for every force, there is a counterforce, which is equal and opposite. So when we have a, a vitreous, a, when we have vitreoretinal traction pulling on the retina, a force pulling the retina uh, 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 anteriorly, as we see on, on the schematic, well, there's an there's a opposite uh, force pushing the, uh, uh, the other way or pulling the other way. And what we have in, in, in between is, is vacuum, is a, re, is a reduction of the tissue pressure. And we know from another Englishman, this is uh, 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 Starling from the 19th century, Starling's Law, who talked about the, the, how edema comes to be. So there's a the balance between the hydrostatic pressure, the uh, pressure difference between the capillaries and the tissue on one hand, and then the osmotic pressure on the other hand. And it's very clear that if we lower the tissue pressure, we increase the pressure difference between, uh, between the vessels and the tissue, and water will flow down that pressure gradient. So this is how, and the, the physics uh, 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 explains this very nicely, this is why traction causes or can cause retinal edema and why releasing that traction will make the edema go away. So completely different from the metabolic uh, physiology I was, I was uh, uh, telling you about before, this is uh, mechanical physics. So to summarize, so what the vitreous humor does is that it controls the transport of molecules through the vitreous cavity. That's basically its metabolic function. It's the transport, it's, the, it's to modulate the transport of molecules, and this of course means all molecules. So if, we, if the uh, viscosity is reduced, either by vitrectomy or by vitreolysis or by uh, the normal degeneration of the vitreous, this will increase the, tra the transport, speed up the transport of all molecules, and this includes, for example, oxygen, cytokines, drugs, and everything else. And so vitrectomy, vitreolysis, vitreous uh, 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 detachment, all have this uh, f this physiological effect or metabolic effect. And we can use this physiology, and when we understand this physiology, it helps us understand both the beneficial effects of uh, vitrectomy or a posterior vitreous detachment on the development of retinal neovascularization, for example, in diabetes or even in AMD, the development of macular edema, for example, in diabetes, and also the harmful effects, which may be iris uh, neovascularization, cataract formation following uh, 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 vitrectomy, and possibly glaucoma. So with that, I thank you kindly for allowing me to partic uh, uh, partic participate. It's great to be with you here in Barcelona. Thank you. This paper is now open for discussion, comment, and questions. You're invited to step up to the microphone and uh, please state your name and city of origin. While you're doing that, I'll ask Einar a question related to vitrectomy. Uh, can you envision ways to mitigate against the increased 
uh, PO2 levels following vitrectomy by either modifying the procedure and as a corollary, can you envision ending a vitrectomy with an injection of vitamin C or other free radical scavengers that might help the physiology? Yeah, I mean, there are uh, several, several uh, possibilities. I mean, one possibility which is already being done is that people are indeed doing limited vitrectomies for posterior pole surgery like uh, epiretinal membranes or, or, or something like that, leaving some of the anterior vitreous intact, just doing the uh, uh, vitrectomy in, in the back and, and leaving the anterior, anterior vitreous basically to cover the lens. The, uh, uh, now, of course, when we do uh, vitrectomy in, 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 in the conventional way and we are infusing the eye with, uh, uh, with uh, water or saline, which is basically at, at room, at, at ambient oxygen level, so it's 21% uh, oxygen. So then, of course, we are for a couple of hours uh, 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 putting in a very, very high uh, levels of, of uh, PO2 in the eye. Now, whether that has any, any uh, short-term effects, we don't really know that, the, but it would be reasonable to lower this to, 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 the, to uh, what, what is the, the physiological PO2 in the eye, which is uh, you know, in the range of 5% oxygen, not 21%. The, but then we can come back to, to some very old considerations because a helon, as you, as, as, you may, as you may remember, helon was developed initially to be a vitreous uh, substitute. That was the idea. And now it didn't work like that, but there may be some advantage uh, 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 in some patients from having a higher viscosity uh, vitreous uh, substitute the uh, 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 silicon oil is that to some degree, but that has, of course, uh, other problems. But maybe we should rethink the helon idea. Question? My name is Harry Kovács from Hungary. Congratulations. And I would like to ask if uh, the arterial pressure uh, doesn't, mean, doesn't change uh, after vitrectomy, as we see, um, but the venous pressure is increased, it doesn't mean that the oxygen consumption of the retina is decreased, so uh, for the oxygen consumption of the retinal tissue is probably more harmful than beneficial. Thank you, this is a, this is a very, very uh, 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 insightful question. The, and, and indeed, as, 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 uh, uh, as, as you pointed out, the, on, the, on the oximetry uh, uh, Im image and, and, and the data, there was no change in the arterial blood. Of course, that comes just straight from the heart. So you would not expect that to change a, a, a whole lot. But the change is in the vein. So, so uh, 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 the, and, 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 and it increases in the vein. So uh, does that mean that there is more, less oxygen being used? It, it would uh, 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 appear like that. I think that a more likely uh, explanation is that there's more oxygen coming from the ciliary body, from the aqueous humor inflow into the eye, which is contributing also to the retina, so that it, so, so that it is not that the retina is using less, but some of what it is using is coming from the anterior part, from the ciliary body and, 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 and the, and the uh, pars plana. So this is supplementing uh, 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 to, the, uh, uh, to the retina, and thus the contribution from the retinal, retinal uh, circulation proper is slightly reduced. So I think that is a more likely explanation than an actual reduction in oxygen consumption. Thank you, Einar. One last question. Uh, thank you, Christian Faulkner Radler from Vienna. Just one question. Um, would you consider to do vitrectomy in um, exudative AMA who are non responders to anti or do some combinations? Well, the one always has to be, you know, careful in, in, in uh, going from, you know, basic uh, physiology to, to uh, uh, clinical recommendations. Uh, but I can tell you there is logic uh, 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 in that approach. The, uh, there are some clinical papers uh, 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 that have suggested that, that a vitroretinal adhesion uh, contributes to uh, neovascular uh, uh, AMD, so that uh, uh, in, in reverse, if the vitreous is uh, 
lifted away that that would be a positive thing. And, and from the standpoint, from, from what we know about uh, uh, vitreous physiology, the mechanism for, for that effect is obvious. So, so I, I, I tend to believe that those clinical uh, observations that uh, have shown us that vitreous, uh, vitreous adhesion is bad if you have neovascular uh, uh, AMD, that those are correct, that those are not only clinical observations, they're also supported by, the, by what we know about physiology. So then you could say it would be logical to perform a clinical study on vitrectomy to uh, uh, improve neovascular uh, uh, AND. So yes, I believe that should be studied in a, in a, in a uh, clinical trial. Thank you very much. Our next presentation will be by Professor Jose Garcia Arumi, entitled Advances in Vitreous Surgery for Retinovascular Diseases. Pepe. Thank you very much, uh, Jory, for inviting me to uh, share with you our experience in the advances in vitreous surgery for retinovascular diseases. These are my financial interests. <coughs> well, in retinal vein occlusions, the new treatments have been addressed to reduce the permeability of the vascular net, mainly with antiangiogenic agents and steroids, to reperfuse the thrombus vein to obtain a choroidal drainage of the retinal circulation or to increase the exchange of fluid uh, between the retina and vitreous cavity. And uh, for central retinal vein occlusion, Michael Op Oprenkak um, uh, thought about the compression of the vein at the optic disc and performed a, a surgery. Uh, the name was radial optic neurotomy. And the, the aim of the surgery was the, uh, the compression of the vein by performing a, retin, uh, a radial optic neurotomy uh, for having more room for the vein to uh, drain the uh, retinal circulation. And uh, he had uh, quite good uh, results and we performed three publications uh, with uh, initial experience uh, differentiating young and old people and really, uh, the results were quite good because um, we obtained this kind of choreoretinal drainage of the retinal circulation, as we can see here in the fluorescein angiography. And this is the, a good way if uh, the, the vein is, is completely closed to drain the retinal circulation through the choroid. We can see another here, and uh, really, this is one of the patients that we operated at, after six months. We saw luck with was 2030, and we can see now this communication be between the uh, retina and the choroid. And uh, Susan Bittner led a multicentric study in which we were involved that uh, was in seven centers in 90 patients. And really the results were quite good. Uh, the primary outcome was the improvement in Logmar or more than three lines after 12 months. And uh, the RON group had 48% of the cases that improved more than three lines compared to 11% with the placebo or compared with 25% of uh, triamcinolone. Really, it was not bad. Uh, and uh, in branch retinal vein occlusion, uh, Osterlo first and after Oprenkak um, thought about the problem of the um, crossing in uh, branch vein occlusion. In most of the cases, the vein uh, is, the thrombus of the vein is at the crossing because uh, the uh, artery and the vein share the same adventitious shed. And uh, the technique was uh, opening this uh, shed around the um, the, both vessels to de decompress the vein and to allow, to allow the brain to drain the, the retinal circulation. We published uh, this paper uh, some years ago combining the sheathotomy uh, is, uh, to, to cutting these additions between the vein and the arteriole to decompress the vein. And we obtained uh, quite good visual acuity. The, uh, the difference, the mean, was from 2100 to 2040, with 70% of the cases improving three or more lines. And this result was permanent. But really, the um, anti-BHF have uh, changed completely the panorama. 
uh, we have uh, drugs that have shown safety and efficacy in multicentric clinical trials. We need that um, need uh, multiple injections during years. And uh, they have displayed completely the bevacizumab, ramicizumab, aflibercept have displaced completely the previous treatment. The surgery really is, uh, had a higher difficulty, possible side effects, but had more permanent effect. But uh, nowadays, the gold standard for these uh, diseases is the injection of anti-VHF or steroids. And what about retinal arterial occlusion? It's a, it's, it's a quite different problem. The management of retinal arterial occlusion is an unsolved problem. And do we have chance to treat? Well, according to the Heide and co-workers publication in atherosclerotic and hypertensive rhesus monkeys in central retinal artery occlusion, after four hours, they had a massive irreversible retinal damage. But our clinical experience is the visual acuity may return even after many hours and probably in branch retinal artery occlusion, we have a longer time. We performed an experimental branch retinal artery occlusion model in a peak eye and uh, with laser, we induced this retinal artery occlusion. And we uh, cut here in order to know how much time do we have to uh, wait until the surgery. And uh, uh, this uh, was the control eyes, uh, this is the case eyes. After uh, six hours, 12 hours, it was not a, a big change. But after 48 hours, 40, uh, 24 hours, 48 hours, it was a very important change. And really, we have ischemia necrosis that uh, began, and uh, after 24, 48 hours, it was very important. Well, in order to solve this problem, a jack laser embolysis was proposed by Opremkak and co-workers with uh, quite good uh, results. Our personal experience in five patients with branch retinal artery occlusion with a mean time of evolution of 18 hours, which is a short time, with visible intraluminal emboli, mean visual acuity of 2060. One case was only with visual fit defect. Laser shots were applied of one millijoule, two to eight shots directly to the embolus. And the results were not spectacular. One patient had a marked improvement from counting fingers to 2030 after a vitreous hemorrhage removal, but the other four patients had no evidence of embolizing and no significant change in visual acuity. And the complications included vitreous hemorrhage in 60% of the patients and choroidal neovascularization in 20% of the patients. And this is the case that uh, worked well. We can see here the embolus and after the uh, jack laser, we had a vitreous hemorrhage that uh, was very dense. We needed to perform a vitrectomy to remove this vitreous hemorrhage. And after the vitrectomy, we observed that uh, the embolus had disappeared. And really, we have here and here, we have completely different story and the visual acuity improved. But in the other cases, in spite of the jack laser, the winding of the retina and the decrease of the visual acuity persisted. It really was a very low percentage. Vitreo retinal surgery was proposed by Payman and co-workers in one case with 60 hours of evolution, and they had some improvement from counting fingers to 20 to 100. We thought that it was a really good idea to reperfuse the arteriole by removing the embolus, and we initially published um, seven cases, and now we have 19 patients with a retinal artery occlusion, less than 36 hours of evolution with a sudden decrease of visual acuity or visual field effect, an absence or market delay of perfusion in fluorescein angiography and uh, visible embolus. Our results were that uh, 16 patients had branch occlusion, two patients hemicentral occlusion, one case central occlusion. Mean age was 64 years. The majority were men. A time from onset ranged from five to 30 hours with a mean time of 20 hours. The median pre macular thickness was 356 microns and the visual acuity ranged from half motions to 2025 20, with a median of 2400. The surgical technique consisted in vitrectomy, posterior halodissection, and this is an animation to show the surgical technique. We have the embolus here inside the vessel, and with a microblade, we performed a longitudinal cut over the embolus in order to uh, 
push the embolus out of the intraluminal space towards the vitreous cavity with a forceps or with a silicon tipped cannula. And uh, after the embolus was uh, removed with a silicon tipped cannula. And now we will enter into the eye and we have an inferotemporal vein occlusion, uh, arterial occlusion, sorry, and uh, we are performing this cut over the anterior wall of the arteriole, just over the embolus, in order to push the embolus out. We push it with the forceps and the embolus did not uh, go, went out. And we, we uh, aspirated with the silicon tipic cannula and we obtain the reperfusion of the arteriole and the, the removal of the embolus. This is another case, it's an interesting case with hemicentral retinal artery occlusion and the embolus was located in the common branch of the, the two superior arterioles and uh, we tried to perform the dissection but the embolus moved from the superior arterioles to the inferior arterioles and we were producing now uh, occlusion of the inferior arterioles. That's why we had to perform the surgery in the common branch of the inferior arterioles and we performed the, the, the section over the vessel. It's not easy because it's, it's quite elastic vessel and uh, it moves. We had some bleeding. We tried to remove the, the blood and to remove the embolus, but it was a small opening and we had to open a little more and more uh, bleeding was observed. And the embolus now, we can observe that is out of the interluminal space is uh, over the retina in this clotted blood. We tried to remove the embolus with uh, the silicon tipped cannula. It was not possible. And with uh, forceps, we removed the embolus. And it's the typical cholesterol rounded glistening embolus. And this is uh, another case. We performed the vitectomy. And uh, we, we see the movement of the embolus inside the arteriole. Really, with the, this uh, microblade, it was not easy to perform the dissection, but at the end, we obtained the opening of the arteriole. And in some cases, like this one, there is a spasm of the arteriole that uh, uh, decreases the bleeding, and for us, it's easier to remove the embolus. Now, the embolus is out of the arteriole, and we aspirate the embolus with the silicon tipped cannula. Well, we obtained the partial or total envelope removal in 16 of 19% of the cases, 84% of the cases, with arterial reperfusion in 73% of the cases, with significant improvement of the visual acuity in 68% of the cases, and this was statistically significant. And the final visual acuity ranges from half motions to 2025, 20, with a median of 2050, and the median visual acuity in reperfusion cases was quite good, about uh, 2030. And we observed a significant reduction of the visual field effect in 68% of the cases. And median post-op macular thickness was 222 microns. The complications that we observed, five patients had a self-limited post-op vitreous hemorrhage with a spontaneous resolution. In 10 patients, we observed cataract that uh, had to be removed. In one case, rubiosis iridis and neovascular glaucoma. This is the first case that we have seen with uh, the total occlusion of the arteriole, the inferotemporal arteriole and the embolus located at the optic disc. And this is 48 hours after the surgery with a complete reperfusion of uh, the arteriole. And we can observe that the embolus has disappeared. We can see here this small hemorrhage, but uh, the embolus is not. And this is the, the second case. Uh, no, I'm sorry, this is the same case after two weeks, the visual acuity improved to 2030. And we can see that the widening of the retina disappeared after two weeks because of the reperfusion of the artery. And this is the second case uh, with the EMI uh, retinal occlusion in the superior arterioles. We can see now the embolus. After 48 hours, the embolus has disappeared. And uh, this is pre-op, this is post-op. and. Uh, the embolus was here, and with a little more of zoom, we will see now the embolus with this hyperfluorescence 
induced by the, the embolus. And after the surgery here, there is not any hyperfluorescence, but we can observe the hyperfluorescence here, which was the locus in which we performed the section of the artery. This is another case of 2200 visual acuity. After three weeks, visual acuity improved to 2025. This was uh, the only case I have operated with the embolus not located at the optic disc. It was located in this crossing between the arteriole and the vein, and it had a very important scotoma in this area. And after 48 hours, the reperfusion was uh, complete, and uh, the scotoma decreased after one week, and after one month, it was completely normal. Well, we had some limitations of the study because it's a pilot study, it's a small, small series. We had difficulty in patient selection because of the time of evolution. In, uh, probably we have only four hours in the central retinal arterial occlusion. In the only case that have operated in central retinal arterial occlusion, I did not uh, obtain re reperfusion of the arteriole. That's why I prefer only to operate branch occlusion or hemicentral occlusion. Probably in, in branch or hemicentral, we have less than 36 hours in all these patients. We need an intraluminal visible emboli, but we have some difficulty in the anterior arterial wall section. We needed sharper instruments. We make this design of this 23 gauge diamond blade that really works much better in those patients. This is an interesting case with a hemicentral occlusion. The superior arterioles were completely closed, and uh, here is one emble, and here we have another emble that was inferiorly, and now we are performing the surgery, and uh, we can see with the diamond blade uh, this uh, quite big embolus but uh, really is a, a, a better instrument to perform the dissection. And this is the, the also the common branch superiorly. And now we will see how we will, uh, now you have seen that uh, the embolus has uh, disappeared and we will do the same with the inferior embolus. We will open the arteriole and we see here the embolus and you will see that the embolus disappears. Uh, by the uh, aspiration of the silicon tipid cannula. And this is the post-op appearance with the retina completely reattached. In conclusion, retinal artery occlusion is feasible to remove the embolus from a retinal artery with restoration of flow and improvement of visual acuity and visual field. Probably we are performing some endothelial damage by the surgery, but in all the cases that we obtain the reperfusion still remain reperfused. And uh, the surgery, as I have said, uh, is performed now only in branch and in retinal occlusion. And uh, we think that we have a better control and effectiveness than with jack laser. And what about the virtual surgery in vascular tumors, mainly in capillary meningiomas, in von Hippel indoor disease, or vasoproliferative tumors? In some cases, these tumors have a, a fibrovascular proliferation induced by the ischemia because of the oxygen demand of, of these tumors. And uh, this uh, fibrovascular tissue acts as in uh, diabetic retinopathy, contracted the retina, and may induce tractional or rheumatogenous retinal detachment. In those cases, we think that the best is to remove the tumor and to relax the, the retina. This is a case of uh, von hippel lindau disease with uh, multiple capillary meningiomas, and uh, in now he had um, a retinal detachment because of a, a, a small hole here located near this inferonasal tumor. And we performed the surgery. We placed a scleral band, uh, 25 gauge instruments. We removed the vitreous. And uh, in some cases, very attached in these patients, usually are young patients. And uh, after the removal of the vitreous, and that uh, in some cases is quite thick because of the inflammatory reaction that these kind of tumors induce over, over the, the retina. And uh, uh, some ciliary is seen after the, the separation of the vitreous. We have to remove up to the vitreous base. And uh, after this, uh, we observed this uh, tissue that was exerting some traction between the tumor and the optic pit, and the optic disc, I'm sorry, and uh, we removed uh, this tissue. And uh, we introduced perforocarbon 
to reattach the, the posterior retina and uh, to be able to work uh, peripherally at the level of the tumors. We remove a little more the, the, the vitreous around the, the tumors and uh, these are quite uh, important uh, nourished tumors with uh, very dilated vessels. And uh, that's why we have to perform diathermy prior to the uh, retinotomy. We relax the, the retina and now we are removing the tumors. And really the, the bleeding, we can observe some bleeding, but it's not a very important bleeding. With these so dilated vessels, you, you could think that really we will have more bleeding, but it's not really a very important bleeding. And we remove the, the tumor that is in this uh, peripheral retina, and uh, we will remove also the uh, peripheral retina, which is a vascular now, non-functional, may induce some degree of inflammation. And uh, this tissue really was uh, very fibrotic, very, very thick, and we remove as much as possible, but we left uh, some tissue at the peripheral area. And you see that there's some bleeding at the level, and we uh, perform the same in the inferonasal tumor and uh, retinotomy, peripheral retinotomy to relax all the traction. And this, uh, in this uh, retinotomy, we included uh, the, the hole that was located here. And we increased the, the bubble of the perforocarbon in order to perform laser at the limit of the retinotomy. And silicon oil was placed into the vitreous cavity. And the initial evolution was good. Uh, with silicon oil into the vitreous cavity, we may observe these uh, remnants of the fibrotic tissue, some bleeding here. And uh, after two months, we removed the silicon oil, the problem, was that uh, the retina redetached because of proliferative tissue. In this case, it was more PBR than fibrovascular tissue. And this is quite common in these young patients with this kind of tumors. And we perform it, uh, it has some cataract. We perform it, the, the cataract uh, removal, leaving the anterior capsule in order to uh, place an intraocular lens in the future. And we stain the, the tissue. And uh, we perform it, uh, the dissection with the staining, with uh, tip and blue, and with uh, perforocarbon into the vitreous cavity. We remove all the tissue that was located at, into the macular area up to the periphery. And really, it was not only inferior, it was also superior because uh, the PBR that these patients have is very important. We remove also the ILM into the macular area in order to decrease the risk of uh, epiretinal proliferation, which is quite common in all these patients. We remove all the, the, the traction that uh, the patient had. And uh, after the removal of all the traction, we perform a laser 360 degrees. It was uh, superior uh, proliferative tissue, which is not uh, quite common in other cases. And we perform a laser. We did not um, uh, more uh, retinotomy. And uh, silicon oil was placed into the vitreous cavity. And this is the actual appearance of this eye with 2040 visual acuity. The macula is okay. And uh, now we are thinking about the removal of silicon oil. And this is another interesting case. It's a vasoproliferative tumor with a very important traction. The macula is completely uh, traction uh, towards the inferotemporal site. And uh, just, uh, the macula is here. And uh, really, in this case, because of this important traction, we needed to remove all this fibrovascular tissue. And to know if uh, really with uh, removal of the tissue it will be okay, or we needed uh, also the removal of the tumor and a retinotomy. And really, after the removal of all this proliferative tissue, we noticed that uh, the traction was very important, and we needed to perform the uh, retinotomy, the removal of the tumor, and uh, the removal of uh, this very important lipid exudation that was in the subretinal space.
diatermic was applied and we performed the uh, on the Vitos probe, the removal of all these lipid exudative the, uh, cholesterol crystals that were uh, in the subretinal space, very adherent to the retina. And um, we introduced uh, the staining with trip and blue and, and uh, brilliant blue is the dual uh, in order to dissect the ILM into the macular area in order to uh, um, try to relax a little more the macular area and uh, improve the visual acuity. It was a very important fall by the traction exerted by the tumor, but now with the um, retinotomy and removal of the tumor, the traction was decreased a lot. And this is the appearance with the silicon oil into the eye. The macula looks a little better, but uh, is not perfect. But now the macula is here, and before the macula was like this position. I'm sorry. In conclusion, the surgical management of vein occlusion has been surpassed by the effectiveness and safety of intravitreal injections, embolectomy in branch and hemicentral occlusion, artery occlusion has high effectiveness in performance in the first hours. A diamond blade is, uh, induces less damage and is more effective in cutting the anterior arterial wall. Surgical ablation, uh, in some cases, if capillary mangiomas uh, induce tractional and rheumatogenous retinal detachment, and the, the same in vasoproliferative tumors with lipid uh, subretinal removal. Thank you very much. This presentation is now open for discussion. Questions, comments? Einar? Oh, sir, please proceed. Thank you for the presentation. Panagiot Salvanos from uh, Norway. And exciting videos. Question, when you do the embolectomy, what kind of intraocular pressures do you use from the machine? And would it be an idea to do it under air so that you have some tamponade from that? Well, when I am performing the cutting, this longitudinal, longitudinal cutting over the arteriole, I need the pressure from the arteriole to push the embolus out. That's why I used 30 millimeters of mercury of ocular pressure. When I open the arteriole, some bleeding appears and I increase the ocular pressure. And I, I aspirate with the silicon tip cannula, I, I remove the, the, the embolus. But really, at the beginning, it's very important to maintain a normal ocular pressure because if you increase a lot the ocular pressure, you collapse the arteriole and it, it, the, the blood does not push the embolus out. And that's why I, I prefer to, to work in this way. And really, it's not a very important bleeding. I think it's not necessary the, the, the uh, exchange with uh, air. I can see much better under fluid than under air. Thank you. Uh, you made the point uh, on, on the embolectomies that time is uh, uh, of the essence, that we only have a few hours. Um, I think it's worth noting that once we are in the uh, um, vitrectomy situation and we are infusing the eye with fluid, which is on one hand 21% oxygen, it's very high oxygen, and also it's cold, it's, you know, it's um, room temperature, it's yeah. 20 degrees. So we are at the same time cooling the retina and also giving uh, basically a new supply of oxygen. Mm -hmm. So the vitrectomy procedure itself probably gives you more time. And it, we might even consider, again, a suggestion for a uh, clinical study, we might even consider using the vitrectomy setting to extend the time. So even if you, know, you yourself uh, are not available or, or uh, an, an expert like yourself within a couple of hours, you know, a regular vitreoretinal surgeon could yeah. establish a, vitre a, a vitrectomy uh, situation and maintain the eye for 12 hours or some period of time. So I think there are some possibilities to extend this very critical time period. I think it's very interesting, your, your opinion. Really, you extend the time. Uh, hyperbaric oxygen camera is another, uh, another option, probably, no? Yes, I mean, uh, hyperbaric, of course, uh, uh, can do some of the same. 
But I think the vitrectomy is much more uh, 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 direct because it gives you the oxygen supply right to the retina, and it's also the cooling. I think the cooling yeah. is also uh, very, very important. And the cooling may last for a while. We don't mm -hmm. know exactly how rapidly the eye heats up after vitrectomy. I mean, it might last as a cooling device for, I don't know, some hours. Uh, yeah, I agree completely. My original intent was to present primarily a lecture on vitreous, but in order to cover some of the topics that uh, Professor Suzanne Binder was going to cover, I'll be talking about vitreomaculopathies as well. These are my financial disclosures. It's very gratifying for me to see how much emphasis is placed on vitreous, and it's the result of an explosion, really, over the last decades of uh, information uh, that has culminated recently with the publication of a 956-page book on vitreous, and my uh, co-speakers contributed to that book, and if you're not aware of it, I, I would suggest uh, taking a look at it. Any consideration of vitreous must begin at the biochemical level, because it is 98% water. There are two structural macromolecules of great importance, hyaluronine renders viscoelasticity, but collagen is the skeleton of the vitreous body. There's an intricate interaction between collagen and hyaluronine, whereby the hyaluronine molecules separate the collagen fibrils by a critical distance to allow the unhindered transmission of photons through the vitreous body to the retina, where vision can begin. We don't really understand this interaction, nor how it changes with aging uh, or disease, but there are structural consequences. Here you can see dark field slit microscopy of a dissected human vitreous body in a 33-week gestational age human embryo, where the anterior segment is below and the posterior pole is above, and there's a homogeneous appearance within the vitreous body except for the site of Cloquet's canal, the former site of the hyaloid artery during embryogenesis. The reason that there isn't very much light scattering is that the collagen fibrils are separated. This changes throughout life. You can see in the top panel the appearance of the vitreous body in a six-year-old and in an 11-year-old individual. This is the back surface of the lens illuminated by the slit lamp beam that is creating the horizontal optical section. By middle age, there are fibers that have an antero-posterior orientation. These fibers insert into the vitreous base and are continuous through the vitreous body to insert into the posterior vitreous cortex. By old age, there's been further aggregation of the collagen within the vitreous body with pockets of liquid vitreous called lacunae and an overall shrinkage of the size of the vitreous body because of posterior vitreous detachment. Ultrastructural correlates of what we just saw by dark field microscopy found no membranes whatsoever, but only bundles of collagen fibrils, such as the one shown here in cross-section. And it was the displacement of the hyaluronan molecules that allowed the collagen fibrils to cross-link and form these large bundles of collagen fibers. This is very exaggerated in old age. As you can see, there are multiple pockets of liquid vitreous with aggregation of the collagen fibrils within the vitreous. This is an important consideration for probably what happens more often than any other event in, in uh, at least ophthalmology, and that is intravitreal injection. All of the pharmacokinetics and pharmadynamics of these uh, pharma pharmacotherapies assume that the vitreous is simply a space, but as I hope you appreciate now, it's more than just a space, but it's a body. And it will make a big difference whether an injection of drug is placed into this part of the vitreous as compared to this part, into a lacunae. And it may explain some of the variability from patient to patient and their response to intravitreal injections, but I'm sure you've all had the same experience that any given patient may not respond to one injection on one month, but will on another month. And I think that's because we don't control exactly where we inject. It would be challenging to try to introduce control over where exactly drugs are injected into the vitreous, but it is a consideration. 
This is a transmission electron micrograph of the human vitreoretinal interface. It used to be believed that the vitreous inserted directly into the retina, but we now appreciate that there is an extracellular matrix with these components in it that intervenes between the posterior vitreous cortex and the neural retina. This is an immunohistochemistry preparation by Greg Hageman of the monkey vitreoretinal interface, which further illuminates the structure of the posterior vitreous cortex. It's organized in sheets or lamellae. And this has consequences with respect to not only the pathology of various vitreomaculopathies, but also our surgical approach. And understanding that the underlying anatomy has a lamellar structure is very important. There is strong adhesion of vitreous to the retina in youth, and here too we don't really understand what is the molecular basis of this strong adhesion, but it must relate to some, if not all, of those extracellular matrix components that were considered on the previous slide. Again, without knowing exactly the source of this, we don't understand why, but it's clear that with aging there's weakening at the vitreoretinal interface. Both the liquefaction of the gel that occurs as a result of displacement of hyaluronin with cross-linking of the collagen fibrils within the vitreous body and the weakening of vitreoretinal adhesion underlie posterior vitreous detachment. And it's necessary that both of these occur in tandem in order for the PVD to be innocuous. When you have gel liquefaction without dehiscence at the vitreoretinal interface, an anomalous PVD results. And the manifestation of that anomalous PVD will vary depending upon where the gel is most liquefied and where the posterior vitreous cortex is most firmly adherent to the retina. This schematic diagram demonstrates the various consequences of anomalous PVD. And if you see the different diseases that are listed at the bottom of this schematic diagram, you'll appreciate that in the past these were considered very disparate conditions. But when considered from the context of anomalous posterior vitreous detachment, it becomes a unifying concept to the pathophysiology of these disparate diseases. For when you have liquefaction without dehiscence at the vitreoretinal interface, anomalous PVD PVD can result in full thickness or partial thickness separation of the vitreous. When you have partial thickness separation of the vitreous, the outer layer of the posterior vitreous cortex remains attached to the retina and underlies the formation of a premacular membrane resulting in macular holes and macular pucker. When you have full thickness separation of the vitreous away from the retina, particularly posteriorly with persistent adhesion peripherally, you can get traction resultant retinal tears and detachments. And we know that areas of retinal lattice are areas that not only have firm vitreoretinal adhesion, but also a pocket of liquefied vitreous anterior to this zone. Here is a retinal tear that occurred uh, in association with a retinal vessel, another area where the vitreous is firmly adherent to the retina, an anomalous PVD with posterior separation but traction peripherally has resulted in the regmatogenous events. Our main focus today is going to be on anomalous PVD and vitreomaculopathies, where you have full thickness separation in some instances. That means all of the vitreous is separated away from the retina, exerting axial traction in this instance on the macula, inducing a vitreomacular traction syndrome. And this plays an important role in loss of central vision with aging, but also in wet AMD. Here you can see a combined OCT SLO image of anomalous PVD with vitreomacular traction. And I'm indebted to Carl Glittenberg and Suzanne Binder for providing this animation of a patient which I'm sure many of you have seen uh, before, but it's a very graphic representation of how anomalous posterior vitreous detachment with full thickness separation of the entire posterior vitreous cortex away from the retina everywhere except in the central macula can exert significant traction upon the central macula with distortions and loss of central vision. It was Suzanne Binder who uh, first brought to my uh, consideration, the role of vitreous in AMD, and it was because in the days where she did a lot of uh, submacular surgery to remove choroidal neovascularization, she noticed that a very high percentage of patients had attached vitreous, and these were all older individuals where the vitreous should have been detached. So she asked 
for my involvement, and I'm very grateful for that, to try to determine whether or not there's a role for vitreous in AMD. And in the first study, we found that there was a two-fold higher prevalence of complete PVD in patients with dry AMD. This was diagnosed not only with OCT, but also with ultrasound. And I think ultrasonography is a forgotten, a forgotten diagnostic technology that is very relevant when interested in vitreous and its impact on the retina. The reason being that if you have a posterior vitreous detachment where the posterior vitreous cortex has separated far enough away from the retina, you'll never be able to see that on today's OCT imaging. Perhaps in the future that will be addressed. But to make a diagnosis of a posterior vitreous detachment solely on the basis of OCT is a misleading approach. When looking at patients who did not have a posterior vitreous detachment by ultrasound and using OCT to identify if there was persistent detachment in the macula, we found a threefold higher prevalence of vitreomacular attachment in patients with exudative AMD. And it was felt that partial PVD with persistent vitreomacular adhesion played a significant role as a risk factor for the development of exudative AMD. A follow-up study was done on patients who had one eye wet and the other eye dry in an attempt to eliminate genetic and environmental factors, and we found the same thing, that if your vitreous was detached, the risk of developing exudative AMD was far less than if your vitreous was attached to the macula. And ANAR has addressed some of the physiologic considerations, uh, much of which goes beyond the scope of this particular presentation. But recently, we started seeing studies that demonstrate a role for vitreous in the response to anti-VEGF injections. Suzanne actually presented the first in 2013, where 334 non-responders to anti-VEGF injections in wet AMD uh, were studied, and it was their impression that these were the individuals who had an attached vitreous and that the responders had a detached vitreous. A study done at the Wills Eye Hospital found that in 204 patients with wet AMD, the presence of vitreomacular adhesion increased the need for anti-VEGF injections. That is, they required more anti-VEGF injections than individuals who had a detached vitreous. And then a study done at Moorfields found that a head-to-head -head comparison of 34 patients with wet AMD who had VMT and 29 patients with with wet AMD who did not have vitreomacular traction, those without vitreomacular traction had better visual acuity and less macular thickening following anti-VEGF therapy. So I think the vitreous does play a role in the pathophysiology, but also the therapy of wet AMD. If there is liquefaction of the gel vitreous without separation at the vitreoretinal interface, the typical separation that we see, you can get a split in the posterior vitreous cortex where the vitreous body separates but it leaves a layer, the outer layer of the posterior vitreous cortex attached to the macula. And here we can see, again, a beautiful 3D OCT provided by Carl Glittenberg and Suzanne Binner demonstrating the various lamellae in the posterior vitreous cortex that we saw earlier by immunohistochemistry in the monkey retina. And these are potential cleavage planes, not only uh, during aging or in various diseases, but also during surgery. Swept source OCT is beginning to show us in greater detail the underlying anatomy of the posterior vitreous cortex, and I think you can appreciate here those same lamellae that are potential cleavage planes during aging and posterior vitreous attachment where the entire vitreous body will separate, but the outer layers can still remain attached to the macula. This is uh, spectral domain OCT demonstrating the inner wall and the outer wall of a patient with vitreoschisis who had macular pucker. We did some studies and found that 42% of eyes with macular pucker had evidence of vitreoschisis as shown here very uh, dramatically. This is also true of patients with macular hole, where 53% of individuals had a split in the posterior vitreous cortex. Here you can see this is full thickness posterior vitreous, but here is the inner wall and here is the outer wall of the split posterior vitreous cortex. And it's important to appreciate that because if you only eliminate this traction here, the patient may not get better.
the dynamics of these membranes is very different. In macular pucker, there is inward contraction towards the fovea, so-called uh, centripetal tangential traction, throwing the underlying retina into folds. Whereas in macular holes, this layer that remains attached to the retina ex exhibits centrifugal or outward tangential traction. And we believe that the reason for that is that there's a much higher incidence of vitreopapillary adhesion in patients who have macular holes as compared to macular pucker. And that this alters the dynamics of the vectors at play at the vitreoretinal interface and contributes to the outward traction in patients with macular holes. Macular pucker is a condition that uh, induces distortions and blurred vision. Here you can see combined SLO OCT of a patient with macular pucker. I would like to suggest that we get away from the term ERM because these are premacular membranes, not epiretinal membranes. And furthermore, ERM has been used to describe the disease. It's actually just a structure, a membrane in front of the macula. And we should use the term macular pucker for the disease that results results from the inward tangential traction of this membrane. The Beaver Dam Eye Study found a prevalence of almost 11%, um, and the Blue Mountains Study found 7% in the general population and 11.6% in people aged 70 to 79. The annual incidence in the Blue Mountains Eye Study was 1.1%, which means in the United States there are 3 million new cases per year. That's not an insignificant number. We found, employing coronal en face imaging of the vitreoretinal interface, that there can be up to four different retinal contraction centers. And there's a clinical significance to this because individuals who have three and four retinal contraction centers have a thicker macula with a higher incidence of intraretinal cystoid spaces than individuals with only one or two contraction centers. We employ three-dimensional threshold AMSR grid testing to quantify the degree of distortion. So it's not just mild, moderate, or severe, but we can actually get numbers represented as the percent volume lost of the hill of vision. The patient is asked to trace the area of distortions on a computer screen, and they're given five different contrast levels of the grid and the background. So on this plane and this plane, you can see the area that the patient uh, drew, and on the z-axis, it's the various contrast levels. And when you stack them in this way, you can get a volumetric representation of the degree of distortions that the patient is experiencing. We have employed this to identify individuals with clinically significant macular pucker and subject them to a vitrectomy with membrane peel. There's nothing exotic about this. The point that is being made here is that no chromo dissection is required. You don't really need dyes to identify the membrane in a patient with macular pucker because they're typically thicker. And they're thicker because the plane of cleavage of the posterior vitreous cortex is anterior to the hyalocytes, so that it's about 75 to 100 microns thick to begin with. Then there's migration of glial cells, probably along the retinal vasculature inward towards the central macula, resulting in uh, further cellularity and further thickening of this membrane, and it isn't really necessary to use any dyes to get a hold of this membrane and peel it, as you see here. The uh, lower retina has already been um, peeled. This is the foveal region here, and with careful manipulation, you can peel it off the central macula with very good effects. And we employed three-dimensional threshold AMSR grid testing to quantify the response to therapy. And you can see here that this particular patient went from 2.24% volume loss to 1.3 and ultimately 0.6% volume loss. So this gives us the ability to evaluate various therapeutic approaches, in this case with uh, vitrectomy. And we recently published our results of three-dimensional threshold AMSR grid testing in patients with macular pucker, where their preoperative levels showed significant amounts of distortions as compared to their normal fellow eye. At one month, it was reduced. At three months, it was reduced even further. And by six months, it uh, reached a steady state. But between the three and six month point, there was significant improvement 
in the degree of distortions as measured with three-dimensional threshold AMS or grid testing. We found the same thing for contrast sensitivity, not as dramatic, but uh, it is valuable to measure both the degree of distortions as well as the contrast sensitivity function to assess the impact of these pathologies on the macula and their response to therapy. Macular hole is another manifestation of anomalous PVD with vitreoschisis. In this case, the split occurs posterior to the level of the hyalocytes, so somewhere around 50 to 75 microns anterior to the retina. The hyalocytes leave with the rest of the posterior vitreous during PVD, leaving a very thin membrane that's attached to the uh, macula, but also to the optic disc in patients with a macular hole. A cuff is seen surrounding the macula, Hole, and that cuff represents most often cysts surrounding the macula hole as seen here. Once again, the vector of force exerted by this membrane on the macula is outward or centrifugal, opening a dehiscence in the central macula. The gas classification is demonstrated here where there's persistent adhesion of vitreous to the uh, macula, usually at the edge of the macula hole in stage three. But in stage four, there's been a PVD, but there's still a membrane attached to the uh, macula. And the origin of that membrane is in many cases, uh, perhaps not all, but in many cases, the outer layer of the posterior vitreous cortex that has experienced um, vitreoschisis. There's a new classification that was proposed in uh, 2013 to uh, better characterize macular vitreomaculopathies, in particular macular hole. I don't want to go into the details, but I do uh, recommend you analyzing this and using it in assessing your uh, uh, patients. Macular hole surgery is performed with chromodissection. It's the use of dyes to uh, facilitate identification, but also in the case of certain dyes to alter the characteristics, the biophysical characteristics of the membrane that was left adherent to the macula. And the objective here is to uh, uh, remove the gel vitreous and then stain it, in this case with doubly diluted endocyanine green dye, to facilitate elevation of the uh, membrane off the retina. I have always begun my dissections along the uh, temporal, usually the inferotemporal arcade, uh, because of the ability to engage far from the central macula. I know that's in stark contrast to Steve Charles, but I feel more comfortable. And I also think that it's a more natural cleavage plane that is achieved once you start to uh, peel at the infrotemporal arcade and elevate a membrane off the retinal surface. So here you can see the membrane is, is coming up. And uh, again, the moment of truth in this surgery is when the membrane is peeled across the central macula and you see it releasing from the edge of the macular hole. Uh, that needs to occur in order for the traction upon the central macula to be relieved and for this patient uh, to do very well. The use of gas uh, has recently come under um, um, re-evaluation, and uh, there are increasing numbers of people who don't use gas following macular hole surgery. I'd like to hear from uh, my co-speakers what their practice is uh, at the present time. Yesterday's symposium discussed the um, uh, inverted flap technique for macular hole surgery, so I'm not going to go uh, into detail here. Uh, simply the uh, difference between macular pucker surgery and macular hole surgery uh, derives from a better understanding of their pathophysiology and the constituent cells and tissues in the pathologic membrane that result in uh, the different approaches. And here you can see the membrane is being pulled off the edges of the macular hole, achieving the following result. At two weeks, there was elevation of the central macula, something that I'm sure many of you have seen. The visual acuity was 2050. At two months, there was flattening of the central macula with improved visual acuity to 2025. A new form of therapy for patients with macular hole is non-surgical. It's pharmacologic vitreolysis, which is a drug therapy to alter the molecular structure of the vitreous body and the vitreoretinal interface. And originally, it was proposed as a way of enhancing or facilitating surgery. 
Uh, it has subsequently been found to be effective in replacing surgery, but one day it may well be that drugs are used to create a posterior vitreous detachment prior to the onset of disease in order to prevent it. Acriplasmin was successful in 27.1% of cases when they considered all uh, comers. But if you have an individual whose extent of vitreo macular adhesion is less than 1,500 microns and there's no evidence of a premacular membrane with pucker, a patient who is phacic and who is less than 65 years old and who is a woman, the likelihood of success increases to 68.4%. And this was based on the data of the clinical trials. Here's an individual who's a 62-year-old phacic woman who had poor vision and distortions with visual acuity of 2200. And this degree of abnormality on three-dimensional threshold AMSR grid testing. 28 days after injection, the vision improved to 2040. And whereas pre-injection, the macula was elevated with a membranous attachment to the edge of the optic disc and to the edge of the macula hole, one month post-injection, you can see this normal indented fovea and the volume decreased. By 15 months, it decreased to 0.15 microliters. And although there was the similar elevation that we saw following surgery for macula hole, it eventually resolved. In this case, it took 15 months. That's pretty unusual. It usually resolves within uh, a few months after vitrectomy surgery. And here you can see the th serial three-dimensional AMSR grid improvements from before surgery out to six months where there's been a reduction in the central abnormality. And it's very useful to have numbers that correlate with uh, the uh, improvement, not just that the visual acuity improved from 2200 to 2020, but that the degree of distortions improved. And so these are the reasons that this individual succeeded. The chances were two-thirds that uh, she would respond to this therapy. The last topic that I'm going to be discussing is what happens if you have a posterior vitreous attachment that does indeed separate away from the retina without damaging the retina. Well, it turns out that even an innocuous PVD can induce visual disturbances known as floaters. And here you can see a photograph of a Weiss ring. This is the ring that, was, that represents the attachment of the vitreous surrounding the edge of the optic disc, which uh, is visible after the posterior vitreous separates away from the posterior pole. This can be detected by ultrasonography. This is the posterior vitreous cortex with the Weiss ring within it. And here's just a Weiss ring anterior to the optic disc. Many patients complain of the shadows that are created of, by this Weiss ring. The other thing that they complain about is the interference of the transmission of light by the posterior vitreous cortex, which is now separated away from the retina and is floating in front of the retina with ocular saccades and with head movement. Indeed, PVD is the most common cause of floaters that bring patients to many of our offices. But the question is whether floaters are a nuisance or a disease. I was taught, and I have taught, that posterior vitreous detachment or myopic vitreopathy inducing vitreous floaters is nothing more than a nuisance. But that isn't the experience of our patients. Indeed, studies have shown that they feel that the negative impact of vitreous floaters is equal to AMD and greater than glaucoma in diabetic retinopathy. Patients feel that vitreous floaters are equivalent to angina, stroke, colon cancer, and asymptomatic AIDS. They are so bothered by their vitreous floaters that they would be willing to accept a 7% risk of blindness, and they would be willing to exchange one out of every 10 years of remaining life just to be rid of their vitreous floaters. And this has been validated by other studies, and the uh, high frequency of vitreous floaters out in the general population has been identified using a smartphone survey to be something on the order of three out of four people have floaters, and one out of three feel that they're impaired by their vitreous floaters. But doctors still consider floaters just a nuisance. Why is that? I believe it's because of the absence of clinical indices of structural and functional abnormalities with which to define vitreous floaters as a disease. And this hampers doctors' acceptance of vitreous floaters as a disease. So we've spent the last several years trying to develop quantitative, objective, clinical indices with which to characterize the severity of vitreous floaters and their impact on vision and well-being. 
and we began by measuring contrast sensitivity function. It was uh, the suggestion of the ever-brilliant Alfredo Sedun that we try to measure contrast sensitivity in these individuals, a suggestion that I initially poo-pooed, but due to my utmost respect for Alfredo, uh, we decided to look, and in fact, he was right. We used the Freiburg Acuity Contrast Test, developed at the University of Freiburg as a web-based test that's available to all for free. And the Weber index is the result of this test. The lower the Weber index, the better the contrast sensitivity. The higher the Weber index, the worse the contrast sensitivity function. And in a series of 96 patients with clinically significant vitreous floaters, we found that the average contrast sensitivity was 4.53% Weber at five cycles per degree as compared to 32 age match controls who had a contrast sensitivity at 2.4% Weber at five cycles per degree. And again, the lower the Weber index, the better the contrast sensitivity. This represented an 89% worsening with highly significant statistics in a patient population complaining of floaters. We did another study looking prospectively at the impact of posterior vitreous detachment on contrast sensitivity function and found that in a series of patients with normal contrast sensitivity who then developed a posterior vitreous detachment, there was 54% worsening of their contrast sensitivity following PVD. Once a vitrectomy was performed on these individuals, every single one normalized. We've also developed quantitative ultrasonography to provide a structural correlate of this functional deficit in patients with vitreous floaters. Because I've shared the same experience that you all have, it's very hard to figure out whether an individual sitting before you complaining of vitreous floaters is just overreacting or whether they have a clinically significant malady. And so we employ quantitative ultrasound to get a structural index of the severity of change within their vitreous. This is particularly useful in young myopic individuals. We developed limited vitrectomy to treat these vitreous floaters. That is a 25 gauge vitrectomy where no posterior vitreous detachment is induced and three to four millimeters of vitreous remain intact behind the lens. And the various physiologic considerations that Anar alluded to were part of the reason, but also the induction of a PVD in an individual who doesn't have a PVD carries with it a 25 to 30% risk of iatrogenic retinal tears. I've performed this operation in 151 eyes of 121 individuals, and you can see their demographics here. Notably, 96 of these individuals were phakic. The etiology of the vitreous floaters was PVD in two-thirds and myopic vitreopathy in one-third. Here you can see the effect of limited vitrectomy on contrast sensitivity function. These are the control eyes. These are the 96 individuals who have clinically bothersome vitreous floaters, their contrast sensitivity was significantly worse than the individuals who had no symptoms resulting. Within one week of surgery, every one of these 96 individuals had normalization of their contrast sensitivity, and it's been sustained at one month, three months, six, 12, 24, 36, and we have some individuals that we've followed for more than four years who've maintained normal contrast sensitivity function. In these 151 eyes, there were very few complications. The mean follow-up is on the order of three years. 115 were followed for more than one year, 79 for two years, 55 for three years, and 38 individuals for more than four years. There were no cases of endophthalmitis no IOP problems. Six individuals experienced a vitreous hemorrhage immediately after surgery, but it cleared spontaneously in every case, did not require any surgery, and the patients were very happy uh, long term. Macular edema of the cystoid variety occurred in one individual, and one individual with diabetic retinopathy had aggravation of diabetic macular edema following the surgery. A retinal break occurred in one 32-year-old myopic individual. It was identified three weeks following surgery and treated prophylactically with no untoward sequelae. Retinal detachment developed in two individuals. One occurred two weeks after surgery, so I do think it was related either on a atrogenic retinal tear or a retinal tear existed prior to surgery that went undiagnosed. Each of these patients, uh, the second patient occurred 14 months following the floater vitrectomy, and it's arguable whether it's related, but I share it with you for full transparency.
Each of these individuals had surgery, very good outcome, and are very happy. Retinal artery occlusions occurred in two individuals. They were in their 70s with systemic hypertension, elderly gentlemen. And um, there have been several consultants looking at the case, and none have felt that surgery was related. But unfortunately, we could never convince the patients of this. Cataract surgery occurred in 16 out of 48 individuals who had a 24-month follow-up. The mean age of these individuals was 64, and no patients under the age of 53 required cataract surgery. We recently published our results in a head-to-head -head comparison with those at the University of Amsterdam, where an extensive vitrectomy is performed, inducing a PVD and removing as much vitreous as possible, in comparison to our technique, where a PVD is not induced, thereby lowering PO2 levels in the vitreous body. And three to four millimeters of vitreous is left intact behind the lens because it contains antioxidants, as were alluded to earlier, in an attempt to mitigate against cataract formation. And what you can see is that at 24 months, the incidence of cataract surgery was approximately 80% following extensive vitrectomy, whereas following limited vitrectomy, it was approximately 30%. Furthermore, the mean time that it took to get cataract surgery following the float of vitrectomy was on the order of seven months following extensive vitrectomy and 12.6 months following limited vitrectomy. So I think that... Uh, the physiologic considerations that we discussed earlier are very relevant and that there are ways to modify the vitrectomy procedure so as to mitigate against cataract surgery. So in conclusion, vitreous floaters have a significant negative impact on the quality of life, primarily by reducing contrast sensitivity function. Measuring contrast sensitivity and employing quantitative ultrasound to evaluate the structure of the vitreous body as well as getting uh, vitreous, uh, um, uh, visual function questionnaires to assess the impact on quality of life are useful clinical metrics for case selection. Limited vitrectomy is effective by normalizing contrast sensitivity and it improves well-being. Indeed, the complications are very few, making this procedure safe and indeed safe enough if we're to fulfill the mission of modern medicine, which should be to help people die young as late in life as possible. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to entertain any questions that uh, there may be. Yes, please. Hi, Pieter Falkenberg from Bern, Switzerland. I have a question. Um, you told us that the patient was suffering from these floaters, and you put it equal to AIDS and colon carcinoma. So in our daily work, uh, we don't have so much time to explain to the patient. So my question is, what is the best piece of advice due to this short time that we have? What is the first thing that you would tell the patient? The first thing I tell the patient is that they're not going to go blind, that this is not a progressive disease, and that what they experience now is probably as bad as it's ever going to be, and to give it time. The average time of coping in our patient population was three years. These are not people who walk in and complain of floaters and get signed up for a vitrectomy on Monday. We ask them to adjust. We ask them to cope. I like to know the people better because as you can relate to, there's a certain personality of the individuals who seek our attention for vitreous floaters. So you have to be careful. And I think that time sorts out a lot of uh, these issues. The second thing I tell them is that laser treatments are available, but there's absolutely no scientific evidence that they work. I don't perform YAG laser treatments for vitreous floaters. I don't know whether my colleagues do or not. But in the absence of objective, quantified measures of structure and function showing that there is efficacy, I don't think it's legitimate to, to recommend this treatment. I think there's a very major placebo effect in that. But um, I, I recommend caution. I recommend waiting. You lose absolutely nothing by waiting. And uh, it, it works quite well. Pepe? Pepe? 
I think that uh, there is a population with uh, high uh, demanding uh, of floaters, which is uh, myopic patients. Myopic patients sometimes have some cataract and the, and the floaters. And the problem is that uh, uh, this patient is operated only of cataract. After the surgery, it sees much, much more the floaters. I think in those patients, uh, probably will be benefit to perform the, the combined surgery, cataract, and, and uh, bit, uh, limited vitectomy, as you have said. Well, that would be uh, uh, very doable in a European setting where combined vitrectomy and cataract surgery is quite routine. The interesting information is that one-third of our patients did not have a posterior vitreous detachment, only had myopic vitreopathy. They tended to be in their 20s and 30s. These are 2020 eyes in a young individual, and uh, I, I have uh, operated on them with some degree of trepidation, but my experience so far is that none of them develop cataracts, and we're now at five and six years, and uh, they are extremely happy, and if they were to develop cataracts at five, six, seven years post-op, they wouldn't complain about that at all. So your point about myopic vitreopathy is a very good one, and uh, I think that it's a very reasonable approach, especially in a European care setting, to do both cataract surgery and limited vitrectomy simultaneously. Yes. Sorry for going back to a very general question, but as you are one of the greatest experts of the topic, let me ask you, what, what is your indication for uh, epimacular membrane surgery? So how do you decide on, on surgery? When a patient has a premacular membrane inducing a macular pucker, is that the clinical circumstance? Yes, it is. Uh, if their distortions are clinically significant and I have the ability, thanks to Alfredo Sedun, to be able to quantify with three-dimensional three threshold AMSR grid testing their degree of distortions. That plus decreased visual acuity. I don't like operating on many 2020, 2025 eyes. So typically, my patients will have 2040, 2050, 2060 visual acuity and demonstrable distortions that can be measured on threshold AMSR grid testing. The anatomic considerations of macular thickening or the degree of corrugation or effacement of the fovea are less important to me their function is, is more important. And in fact, I find it somewhat frustrating in individuals with macular pucker to do a perfect procedure, but they never get back their fovea in some instances. And I don't know what's different about those individuals from the ones who have restoration of good foveal anatomy. Functionally, they get better, their acuity improves, their distortions diminish, and we can measure that postoperatively with three-dimensional threshold AMSA grid testing. But I use the functional criteria more than the anatomic criteria to select patients for vitrectomy with membrane peel. Thank you. Well, I think this brings a close to the Scapins International Society Symposium at SOE 2017. I'd like to thank my eminent co-speakers for contributing to the success of this symposium, and I thank you for your rapt attention. Good day. <laughs>